Hi everyone, welcome back to the Mill Creek Government Channel. I'm Jessica Stutzman. As promised, I have a very interesting guest back on our show today to discuss one of my favorite topics, marine archaeology. We pulled our resident Lake Erie shipwrecks expert, Dave Boughton, off the boat to be here with us today. Dave is the Maritime Education Manager for the Pennsylvania Sea Grant. Dave, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, I know you want to get back to your shipwrecks and back on the boat, so before we dive back into part two of our shipwrecks discussion, the first thing I want our viewers to know is who is your organization, the Pennsylvania Sea Grant? Good question. Nice to see you again, Jesse. And uh, uh, Pennsylvania Sea Grant is a part of a bigger picture. So uh, Pennsylvania Sea Grant is one of 33 Sea Grants that are based at uh, coastal states, mm -hmm. Great Lakes states, and they represent uh, kind of the citizen engagement part. We are funded through the federal government, so it's a federal-private-state partnership where NOAA provides us with funds, which is our, kind of our base funding, and they pay that directly to the local university. In this uh, case, it's Penn State Barron. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they, in turn, uh, so I become a Penn State employee that's funded through the National Oceanographic and Aeronautical Administration. So that's kind of how it's uh, set up financially. And then, so these 33 different uh, sea grants you know, depending on where their locality is, have different specialties and different focuses. Mm -hmm. And what is the mission, the overall arching mission of the Pennsylvania Sea Grant? Yeah. Well, each Sea Grant has three primary functions, and that is for outreach and education, but both of those two are based upon the research that it stimulates, funds, and identifies as a priority. Mm -hmm. And I view it as whatever we're doing for research becomes an educational opportunity. Mm -hmm. So that's where I get my marching orders and develop educational programming from the research we do. Right. And the 33 programs that you mentioned, which are, again, all across the country, um, do these programs collaborate with each other? And then do you guys have similarities and differences between each of your sea grants? They do. Just as between the north and the south, we have different uh, unique uh, features to our coastal waterways. Um, uh, in, in our area, we have a Great Lakes network. So it would involve the states that surround, uh, you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, uh, New York, Ohio. You know, we have our own network, and it's pretty much focused on Great Lakes issues. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's a Mid-Atlantic group, and there's a Gulf group, and they uh, specialize on what's, you know, the current issues at the time because they they change from mm -hmm. year to year. You know, lately, if uh, you know, five years ago, hazardous algae blooms were not an issue as much right. on the Great Lakes as they are today. So. Right. You know, we kind of uh, are in a responsive mode. Right. And then um, locally, what are some of the projects that you guys are finding, you know, really interesting or really important to the environment and to the people right now? I'd say some of the, the most, uh, the current topics that are of the most focused right now, I, I think the hazardous algae blooms is of great concern. Mm -hmm. And but, why is that? Just well, explain to our, our viewers why those are so harmful. Anything that, uh, that creates that much impact as far as the health and welfare of the people, you know, uh, a hazardous algae bloom, uh, the, the scientists are, are, are still studying, you know, what are the cause and effects. We know the effects. And uh, this past season, we were in a position where we had to post some of our popular waterways, which was, you know, disappointing for the public, but we wanted to advise them that the possibility exists. We haven't gotten to the point where we have human health beyond skin rashes, but there are, have been times when the algae counts are so high that you know, they could kill people's pets, which are mm -hmm. parts of their family. So, and there's a lot of people when they walk their pets out there, especially on the peninsula, and dogs are gonna drink the water. And right. uh, so we're, we're having to monitor that, still studying it. Also, we have plastics, we have marine debris, are a huge problem in the Great Lakes as well as in the marine environments, and that's something uh, we're concerned about because that seems to be ongoing. Mm -hmm. You know, we do cleanups and we analyze what type of uh, plastics are found on the beach, um, and it's just whatever we take off the beaches, it's it's there the next week. It mm -hmm. seems, you know. And by plastics, um, I'm sure you're talking about the big plastic pieces that you find, but are those microbeads also a concern? They are. 
they are they're the microbeads and then there's the curds and the stuff that is the bulk plastic uh, that we're finding in the lake as well so it can be microscopic as well as you know regular plastic bags that we get from the supermarket you know mm -hmm. so you, there's things just like a macro and a micro view there's things that we can see and obviously don't look pleasant in the water but uh, unknown to our, our eyesight you know there are things in the water that are microscopic that still get tangled up in the fish gills and we end up consuming those you know mm -hmm. so and how do microbeads form exactly well some of it work some of it were some of it is transported in a microbead uh, um, you know where it goes to the injection molds for whatever it's used for so what it has we found in the past is there were several companies that were using micro beads in shampoo mm -hmm. and very small. And those were like the exfoliating shampoos. Exfoliating, yeah. Okay. And <laughs> so people didn't think in advance about where that would end up, but that all makes its way through the uh, sanitary sewer system and gets, and that's not something that, uh, you know, is being screened at the wastewater treatment plants. Right. The other one, Jessica, that I wanted to mention was, which is an, uh, an unseen thing, it, which is what scares me, is the pharmaceutical mm. uh, impact upon the waters. Right, the, and, and those have, have been referred to as the PPCPs? That's correct. Okay. And uh, you're, you're pretty sharp I'm, there. I'm up on my environmental impressed. game here. Good job. <laughs> so these are things that you can't see in the water, but they exist within the water. And uh, just as when we all take prescription drugs, you know, they all go through our body and they end up going through the wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. But these things are not being screened, mm -hmm. nor are the microplastics. And for some of the uh, hormone and estrogen drugs that are being used, we are, we are finding fish that are neither male nor female mm -hmm. and they cannot reproduce. So when we get to the point where we have human harm, that becomes a top issue. Right. So that's kind of what drives things if we prioritize what, what we're working on. Right. So some of these pills um, and, and pharmaceuticals that people take today, whether they're unused pills and you're, you know, people are unfortunately flushing them down the toilet, yes. or if they're being ingested and then, you know, and then execreted out, mm -hmm. they're still finding their way to the waterways. They are. Okay. And then fish are, like you said, ingesting them and then they're causing biological health problems to the fish. Right. It's not very widespread right now, but that's been linked to the presence of pharmaceuticals in the water. And we're trying to monitor that and find out, uh, you know, what can be done about it. Right. Right. And one of the other things that I love that you guys do um, is the newspaper and education series. Oh, yes. Can you touch on that? Oh, sure can. Well, uh, my uh, colleague, Anna McCartney, who, who used to be with the Erie Times and is very passionate about the environment, you know, works with us to cover some of these topics and get into more detail. Of course, it's an education page, so it's always geared toward how can we, you know, inform uh, our young students, and we usually target uh, um, middle school grades, but also to inform the public at large mm -hmm. as to some of these issues. So she's been doing that for years and does a really nice job of informing the public and getting the word out on you know projects that uh, we feel very passionate about. Mm -hmm. Those are great pages. If you've never seen um, those NIE pages, they are very informative. They uh, Anna does such great research. They they are really really nice to read. Um, and then some of the other things you guys work on: bluff management, land conservation, water quality. You guys have a lot going on. We do, we do. And there's another one that uh, I never think it gets enough fanfare, and that's we have a gentleman named Dave, Dave Skelly that works with Sea Grant, and he's one of those unsung heroes that works behind, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Well, that'd yes. be Dave Skelly, all right? He uh, was formerly with planning, Erie mm -hmm. County Planning, and uh, he has been, over the years, working with various organizations, conservancies, uh, the Fish and Boat Commission, to provide pres to preserve and to provide access to coastal waterways. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, fishing locations for steelhead fishermen, uh, preserve shoreline along streams, as well as our coastal areas. And I think he's uh, had a hand in preserving up to, you know, over 1,800 acres through mm -hmm. his career. And so, and Dave does do so much. We've worked together on, you know, uh, streamside restorations and planting additional trees. Um, you know, he does, he does so much and he is a wealth of knowledge. He is. Along with the rest of your staff. He's very capable and so he plays kind of a sideline there, but he's been at it for so long. That's another aspect of Sea Grant where we have some in-house expertise that can really get the ball rolling and make things happen. Mm -hmm. you know. And what I want to touch on next yes. is your expertise. What's that? Well, you are the Maritime oh. Education yeah. Manager. Yes. Right? Okay. So how do you educate the public on these environmental topics of concern? Well, specifically to uh, the shipwrecks and the marine mm -hmm. environment. Well, 
we formed, I think the last time we spoke, I told the story of how the shipwreck was found on Presque Isle. Yes. And then the question came up as to, okay, whose shipwreck is it? And then it was recognized that it was a part of the Commonwealth state, and but the expertise didn't exist. We're not really known as a shipwreck state, you mm -hmm. know, Jesse. So we formed the Pennsylvania Archaeological Shipwreck Survey Team, mm -hmm. which was modeled after some other organizations around the Great Lake. But our focus was there to gather a pool of experts to do historical research, to do technical diving with a local dive shop, mm -hmm. and also to do some conservation science, which is preserving some of the artifacts that have come into the uh, Ridge Environmental Center. So this is all done under the banner of the Regional Science Consortium, which are the science labs at the, at the Ridge Environmental Center. Mm -hmm. So we've been at that since uh, 2014 when we first discovered that wreck. So just as we're doing the research on the shipwrecks and we're moving each year to survey as many of the shipwrecks as we can, you know, we're in the business of um, gathering information and doing an inventory. So we received some initial funds to do an inventory of the shipwrecks between the New York border, the Ohio border, and the Canadian border. Okay. So we got like 76 miles of shoreline and we have a square of the middle basin and we want to do the very best job of cataloging and determining how many shipwrecks you know are there and right and that doesn't sound like a uh, maybe a large area to people because you're thinking of oceans with shipwrecks we have quite a few shipwrecks off of Lake Erie and off of Presque Isle okay and are you asking me a question yes, yes. is that what you're doing that's what yes. I'm asking yes All right. well on the big picture because uh -huh. we're going big and then we're focusing locally you know it, it is thought that there are as many as 8,000 shipwrecks throughout the Great Lakes. That's incredible. Yeah, but close to home, you can look at Lake Erie and break it into three parts, the Western Basin, the Middle Basin, and then the Eastern Basin. Well, we occupy the Middle Basin, and the Middle Basin is known to have, through historical records, 132 shipwrecks. And why is that? Why are we so prevalent for shipwrecks? This is our weather. Oh, do, do I have to tell that story too, yes, can I? Yes, please oh, we have do, to? please. Okay, well, ship, you know, Lake Erie, is the location for the perfect storm. Mm -hmm. So I want you to picture it. You got the other Great Lakes, but Lake Erie is kind of an east to west lake, right? Mm -hmm. It's located in that position where you have the Gulf weather systems coming from the south. You have the Arctic coming from the north, all right? You have the western basin of Lake Erie, which is 12 to 20 feet, the middle at 60 feet, mm -hmm. and then going up to 120 in the western. So it's funneling to the west, headed toward Niagara Falls, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the Presque Isle Peninsula, and you have Long Point. Right, which is the Canadian, Long Point is off Canada. Exactly, and that juts out into the lake as a result of the glacial action that formed the Great Lakes. So you have atmospheric pressures, mm -hmm. okay, where the two fronts collide, and then you have the water flow that goes toward Niagara, and it, you know, through gravity, and then it's pushed together on the sides by the peninsulas. It's a recipe for what is known on the lake as the uh, uh, standing waves or the, the devil winds, uh, mm -hmm. it, it has a number of different names. But what happens on Lake Erie, because it is the shallowest of all the lakes, is you can be out on a fairly calm day and within a very short period of time, you can go from a three foot waves to 12 to 15 and, and, and larger. And it is based on how shallow Lake Erie is, because like you said, it's the shallowest of the lakes. Yes. Does that also make it easier to dive these wrecks? It does. The, the the wrecks are more accessible. Our, our average depth in the middle basin is 60 feet. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are some. I think the deepest place is like 244 feet. Okay. Yeah. And so when you dive these wrecks, um, uh, I know that you, I've got some stuff on the table here. Oh yeah, so, I like to bring things in to show you, Jesse. Okay. All yes. right. Um, should we get into our robotics, or should we? Are we ready for that? Well, we can do that. Okay. Um, so we also talked, we were talking about how we uh, educate and talk to the public and share with them the information we've learned. So the team, which is focused on experts, of the dive team is based out of Erie. It's coordinated through Divers World. Mm -hmm. They're basically the dive masters that are, are employed through the shop, and we train additional um, survey divers, have their own certification, and they do all their work and their research. Well, I'd like to include, you know, the students in this, all right? Right. So whereas the divers do their work, the dive team is the dive team, the historians do their research to, mm -hmm. to give us locations, and Coastal Zone Management drags the sonar to give us our locations, you know, and that, that's when we send the dive team down. Um, so we have uh, several different robots here. 
Okay. We have the sea perch, and I think I brought in a variation of that yes. last time. It was the yellow robot, I believe. Right, right. Yeah. It was quite large. And that was a prototype, mm -hmm. a larger one. But this is the basic uh, sea perch, and this was developed by the Office of Naval Research. It's okay. an open design, and I've been uh, constructing these with students for... Uh, about nine years now, maybe and, hundreds of them. And students are creating these. These as well. are students as young as fifth grade. Okay. And up to you know even even seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. It's a basic model of uh, underwater propulsion made with uh, you know common parts you'd find at a hardware store. They learn how to solder. Um, we do buoyancy testing on it. But it's a great introduction to robotics, you mm -hmm. know, and it's something that can be done and given the opportunity, these kids can do that type of work. And then it, it, and it gives me great great pride to be able to take these out on the research vessel in our work boats and make them a part of the survey that mm -hmm. we do. So, but today, I brought the deep trekker, Jesse. Oh yes, this is the big one. And this, you said, is the commercial grade. This is a commercial okay. grade ROV. <clears throat> um, and the, the, the capacities of each are, are striking. The cost as well, our, our student built sea perch are basically about $110 without a camera on them. Okay. You know, so they're relatively inexpensive. Right. The deep trackers, uh, five or $6,000 worth of technology wow. with um, dual thrusters. Mm -hmm. um, I have a depth capacity of 30 feet with our sea perch, mm -hmm. and whereas I have a 150 foot capacity for the deep tracker. Okay. So if I go down to a shipwreck that's 100 feet, I still have 50 feet of play mm -hmm. to do uh, surveys and, and flyovers. Mm -hmm. I can attach GoPro cameras here. It has an HD camera on it. Uh, it has lights, and, and, it, and it's quite fast, and it's operated through this, uh, this control here. Okay. So I'm actually watching it on the screen here and operating it through the joysticks to descend and to go port starboard down. So this is a high-tech video game. It really is. Okay. Yeah, and there's some real experts out there you know, amongst our students. Uh, and I don't want to get too far off yeah. track. When you are launching these, I know that you work closely with Gannon's Environaut. Yes. And are I'm, you on this ship when you're launching these? Well, thanks for mentioning that. Okay. that. That's a part of the educational program that I do. So the past is one thing. So we do have a contract with Gannon University mm -hmm. to utilize their boat. It's more of a cooperative uh, education program. And I do use the Sea Perch on there. That's one of my learning stations. So mm -hmm. we rotate from four different uh, learning stations and I take students out there from seventh grade up and I've been doing that since uh, you know 2006 so I've taken thousands of students out and let them become the scientists of the day we use the robots to collect some samples and let them know that students built those robots and you know this is how that works so we do not use the commercial grade right off the Environaut we have used the dive boats that are employed through divers world for the deep water wrecks, and uh, that's what we take out with the dive team. Okay, and you said you're doing some surveys underwater. Yes. What are the difference between the student-made ROVs and the commercial-grade ROVs? What are the different things you're surveying? Well, what both of them are doing is, uh, for the Sea Perch, we get a nearshore survey. We have a 30-foot capacity, mm -hmm. so we can't get down to the deep wrecks. These right. are the nearshore wrecks here, but for both of the robots, it's giving us a, a, a visual image. So when we go down to a shipwreck, the objective is to get its location and then the divers go down and they actually measure the location not just of the shipwreck but of the debris field around it mm -hmm. and they triangulate its position on the map. So if there are scattered things throughout the shipwreck, you know, the divers are down there with hard tapes and they actually take measurements. They want to get the exact location and characterize the debris field. So the ROVs are used as well as our videographer team that does the uh, filming to do a flyover of the shipwreck to do a photo mosaic. Okay. So they splice these photographs together and we have a visual image both over the top and of the side of how the, the ship sits down underneath the water there. Right. And so these surveys that you're talking about are very similar if, if I'm picturing um, archaeological surveys on land. Yes. You guys are doing the same thing underwater. Exactly. And then all this data we've collected, we submit this to the Pennsylvania <coughs> Historic and Museum Commission and that goes on their inventory and we're, they only had three before we started. So, and, in, and how I extend this to the students is I have a long tarp of a photo mosaic and just this past week I was using it where we bring the students in to do the same type of thing the divers would do. We have a, a plexiglass, or not a plexiglass, but a PVC grid, which we use underneath the water. We do it in the pool for training the dive team. I also do this with the students. They 
set up a datum point, they triangulate artifacts that are on this large tarp the same way we, we would train our survey team to go down and make them a part of it. It's a lot of fun. That's incredible. Yeah. I want I want to be a student. Oh, I want to go down. You're with, always I welcome, Jess. Be on the boat. I want to go down with you guys. This is fantastic. Okay. Um, what I want to get into next, because this is my favorite part, the the storytelling. Yeah. We've got three shipwrecks that I want you to tell our viewers about. We've got the Bayhead wrecks, the Gherkin, and the Dean Richmond. Yes. Can you touch on those a little bit? For yeah, us? I can talk. I can talk about those. These are our targets for this coming year. Um, we have some deeper, deeper wrecks here as we advance. But the Bayhead wrecks are in what I call the elbow of Presque Isle. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, actually behind the, the ridge center in the shallows there. There's three wrecks there, and we had known that they were there. We had initially surveyed them, but we knew nothing about them. Our historians could not find any information. So one of the uh, interviews that we did during our shipwreck exhibition last year, a gentleman came in, and he happened to have been the captain off the Perka. So we did a living history interview with him and his first mate, who was a biologist. And uh, as a matter of, of the course of our conversation, we mentioned that we were looking uh, into the history of these ships. And he said, I know those ships well. Those, they were my grandfather's. One was his grandfather's. And it was scuttled uh, in 1914. So there's the, the Charles L. Mm -hmm. and the Seabird that had, were scuttled uh, you know, after they had lived their useful life and they're there. And now they're just barely protruding from the water. So it's a very shallow uh, wreck there. There's not much left of the ships, but that's one that's on our target to, to do the summer. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, we have the Gherkin. Okay. Okay, the Gherkin was a sand sucker and uh, it had been doing some, uh, some work on Presque Isle and uh, ran into one of these standing wave storms, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, it sunk and three, uh, three of the sailors were lost. It had all the gear and it's sitting upside down. Um, and the, th the next one is the Dean Richmond. Okay, and, and what's the history behind the Dean the Richmond? The Dean Richmond, they were mostly cargo carrier. It was an arched cargo carrier. Um, it was a, a, what's considered a, a wooden propeller, screw, mm -hmm. a screw ship. And uh, <clears throat> I think it was carrying, I think pig iron was on the, uh, on the Dean Richmond. And uh, it went down in a storm in October in 1893. And uh, so, you know, I'm just thinking about this, Jess. So all of these shipwreck sites, mm -hmm. you know, they're all potential places where people lost their lives. And I was just going to say that. I mean, if you're a diver, this is a cemetery. Really. It really is. And we approach it without respect. We are not in the business for taking things away from the ship. We're trying to document what we have, so we have, you know, a viable, in, you know, inventory of these shipwrecks to support, you know, the mission of the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission. Mm -hmm. You know, to have a lending hand here. So we have a lot of people that are very enthusiastic to help with this, but we are very much in control of, you know, what we do, and you know. And, and to have that respect for the sailors that did lose their lives. Right, right. Yeah. And so, and we did uh, talk a little bit that Erie has such a quite, quite a rich history. And um, you had mentioned to me before the show about a few more archaeological sites found off of Presque Isle. That's right. So, what are those sites? Well, they're, they're interesting because, you know, Presque Isle has a long history. The name Presque Isle is French. Right. So before, you know, when Dassault got here, when the French had a presence on Presque Isle to the point that they gave it a name, they established stockades here. So there was a stockade at the eastern end of Presque Isle, which at this point, the whole topography has changed. Mm -hmm. So there, it was a wooden stockade, and so there's never been the discovery of where that stockade was. So we, are, we have a team that's uh, interested in trying to identify that. It was wooden with the French. The British came and they used brick. Um, they built barracks and block houses, and, uh, and let's see what else we had. We had the, the French fort, Mm -hmm. And then we have Misery Bay. And what's, what's so important about Misery Bay? Misery Bay is historically has it all. We know the Neil Dow has been sunk in there. There are three to four other hulls that we do not know the origin of. We know that the entire fleet, both the American squadron and the captured British squadron, was taken to Misery Bay, and that's where they were moored. And actually, mm -hmm. they were sunk there for 100 years, as well as the Wolverine. Mm -hmm which was the iron ship. So there's a lot of history in Misery Bay, and much to my surprise, it's never been fully surveyed. So there's a lot of mysteries. 
right. and excitement regarding that. Oh, absolutely. So we use three different things. We have a sub-bottom profiler. Mm -hmm. We can do a side scan sonar, look to the surface. Sub-bottom profiler looks underneath the sediments. And then we use a magnetometer, which will identify on a grid pattern of uh, Misery Bay or any of our underwater sites exactly where these concentrations are, which are, are known as anomalies. Mm -hmm. Dave, I love talking to you yeah. about this because you're so passionate about it. I love hearing all of these stories. Why is it so important to continue to discover and learn about and teach about these shipwrecks? Well, most of the things that involves what we're doing now uh, just uh, genuinely encompasses science, technology, engineering, and math. You know, the ability to go underneath the water is a science in and of itself. To do the work underneath the water re requires the engineering and the math to measure, to calculate, to triangulate, you know, to establish its location there underneath the water. So that at the end of the day, we can tell the story that people can learn to uh, not just have respect for the mariners and mm -hmm. our, uh, our maritime history of the area, but, um, but also to build confidence in themselves through these studies. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to do math, but it's another thing to do math when you have a project that you're working on, that you can apply those mathematics, so that engineering and science. Mm -hmm. So I look at it sometimes as a segue. I'm the kind of teacher that likes to teach people. I, I'll sneak right up on you while you're looking at me and teach you something that you wouldn't even know has gotten inside of you. Dave, every time I am with you, you teach me something new. I oh, love being around you. I'm honored. <laughs> I wanted to thank you so much for being on this show. Um, we have so much to talk about all the time. I love these shipwrecks. Um, folks, if you have any questions about the shipwrecks, feel free to give Dave a call. Again, when you're on Presque Isle and you're out on Lake Erie, just know that there is a wealth of history below you underneath the waves. And until next time, have a wonderful day. You're watching the Mill Creek Government Channel, powered by WQLN Public Media.